you can request the same workers year after year. So it wow. lessens the time on training. They show up uh, ready to work and know the process. And because you're able to get them back there, you can almost make crew leaders and uh, drivers out of some of the uh, workers. One new worker that I had this year, a gentleman named Carlos, he came as a recommendation of one of my people that were here in 2022. He was a relative. He was a truck driver in El Salvador. And the minute he came, you noticed certain things about him. If he was riding in a truck and the truck was backing up, he'd immediately get out unprompted to back the truck up into place and just, you know, started to notice safety features that professional drivers have. And we, we spoke with him and went in and uh, lined up to take a driver's test and he passed it with flying colors and uh, got him on our insurance and he started driving for us this year. And it's a wow. big boom. It's a yeah. big boom. So, so you're able to develop them by getting them back year after year year after year and uh they become comfortable with you the surroundings the job they make relationships with your, your other employees it, it really is a, um, a a good program when it works the way it's supposed to welcome to peer talk a dialogue with business owners just like you peer talk conversations run the gamut of business challenges facing owners today the host of Peer Talk is Dan Crowley, founder and owner of Peer Executive Groups, which provides a safe space for owners to share their experience, grow their businesses, and learn from their peers. Hi, this is Dan Crowley. We have a number of great owners in our peer group network, just like you, and our job is to give you a voice here on Peer Talk. Today's episode is sponsored by Robert Bell Insurance Brokers. They were founded in 1983 by Bob Bell to be the independent leader representing the equipment and party rental industries. Over the next decade, Robert Bell Insurance became that innovative force to provide the best price, industry knowledge, and service to the rental industry. Our guest today on Peer Talk is Michael Fitzwater, the president at Special Events Virginia. This is located down in Suffolk, Virginia, and Michael has been president since June of 88. So he's been there for 35 years now. Prior to that, he got his uh, Bachelor of Business Administration at James Madison right there in Virginia. Michael will be talking with us about H2B employees and how that works. Everybody, it's Dan Crowley from Peer Executive Groups with another Peer Talk. Um, we're excited. Today we have Mike Fitzwater from Special Events. He is down in coastal Virginia, it's coastal Virginia, correct? Down that way, That's correct. And yes, uh, Mike, welcome to the program. Yeah, I'm a, a Mike Fitzwater, owner president of uh, Special Events Virginia. We uh, serve coastal Virginia area, as Dan mentioned, and uh, we currently have 28 employees. We do uh, tenting for events and uh, staging, tables, chairs, linens, much like many of you. Uh, this year in 2023, we'll uh, gross over 4.1 million in sales and have an EBITDA over a million dollars. Wow! Our main our main customers are uh, the military here in Norfolk, the largest military base, uh, corporate events, and uh, festival planners. So, Mike, were you a uh, is this a family business or did you get into the industry differently? It is not a family business. We. Uh, I had a business partner who passed away in uh, March of 2020, and uh, he was 20 some years older than I was. And uh, we started this thing back in uh, 1988, and uh, and wow. just grew it with no no industry knowledge of rental. <laughs> wow, well, that's great. Well, it's good. I mean, you know, we have we love uh, the. Um, generational businesses that we have inside peer groups, but it's always neat to hear about how someone finds themselves in the rental industry. And I wanted to make sure we at least got that out of you. Now, now let's talk about the topic at hand. Today, we're going to talk about H2B, uh, which I'm sure a lot of people right now are scratching their head what that means. I noticed that the ARA has done an article about it, um, and we'll get into that a little bit. But what was the actual problem that brought all this about so what was happening in our industry that has caused us to have this type of issue so like many other companies 
uh, we've always struggled with the seasonality of the business and finding qualified workers. It always seemed that by the time we got our crews fully staffed and trained, in a couple months, it was the end of our busy season. Uh, we are actually better off than a lot of businesses because our season runs uh, from about the middle of March till December, or at least the middle of December. But once it stops, it, it drops about 65% from peak season to slow season. Wow. And, and so we do what a lot of rental companies would do. We would use all the profits that we made in the year just to get through the slow season and try to retain as many of the great employees as possible. So the, so the cost of labor, uh, qualified workforce, um, you know, and then, of course, losing people over seasonality all seem to be contributing factors uh, that something had to pop and we had to find some solution. So tell us about H2B, that what you know about it and uh, maybe some origin story about it. So, you know, as far back as 20 some years ago, I heard of other companies, uh, other tent companies that were hiring foreign workers and, and uh, to handle the peak demand of the season. Uh, this is something that had been going on for many years and, uh, you know, in the ski resorts and uh, resort areas, the seafood industry and the landscaping industry. But it really started to uh, take hold more in our industry, you know, basically right about 20 years ago. So, for those of you who don't know, the H-2B program, it is a government uh, program. Uh, it's administered by the Department of Labor. It will allow seasonal businesses to hire temporary non-immigrants to perform non-agricultural work. There is a separate program for the agriculture industry. In uh, 1986, the Congress gave the Department of Homeland Security, which was known as the INS back then, the authority to issue 66,000 H-2B visas every year. And that number has always been consistent, no matter how large or how, um, you know, how subscribed the program became. Because the program become oversubscribed, in 2015, Congress gave an exemption to the cap and allowed the uh, Department of Homeland Security to issue an additional 66,000 or so H-2B visas each year. Huh. Got it. So you're saying total 132. Yeah, give, give or take a little, little, okay. little over that number. But yeah, that's, that's what is typically authorized uh, every single year. And, and they uh, can go. And, and is it is that total amount available to both non-agricultural and agricultural? Or is it like, no, this is they have separate. For yeah, agriculture. That's, that's this is just the non-agricultural uh, oh. visas uh, alone. Got it. And, awesome. And, and, and to give you an idea, there's probably somewhere in the neighborhood of about eight thousand companies every year that apply to be part of this program. How, how many can you say that number again? About eight thousand companies. Eight thousand apply every year to be part of this uh, program. Okay, got it. Got it. Wow. That's a lot. But the, then you get so the headcount. So that means essentially like how how many uh, people can uh, one company like your company uh, go after? Like what are you capped on how many you could can try to bring over or? Well, you, you have to prove a need. So you have to show historical data of temporary employment. And gotcha. then it has to be in line with. Uh, you know, your revenue and, and you have to justify the need so that if you look at your thing and every year you bring on, you know, uh, five seasonal people to get through the season, you obviously couldn't go and get 30 workers or something like that. You know, that, you, gotcha. it would have to be similar to what you've had uh, in the past uh, ba based on what they're going to grant you. So it's a justification process that you go through in the application of uh, trying to get workers. So for okay. us, we would be at, uh, you know, like I said, we're 28 employees, we'll be that way through the winter. And then uh, the last couple seasons, I have brought in uh, six workers to, okay. supplement, uh, to supplement that. So six, 
Got it. So that that's interesting. So that's a good ratio. That's pretty significant. So let's talk about um, how you see it, uh, the advantages of that type of program, H2B. Well, the, the main advantage is that you get a reliable seasonal workforce. Uh, these guys that come in from uh, Mexico or Guatemala or Honduras or El Salvador, uh, they come here to get a better life for their families. They work every single shift. They do not call in sick. They want to work as much as you want them in the time period that they're here. So they're, they are eager to work and they show up and they follow instructions. And, and it's just, uh, what, what can I do? What can I do to make, make this thing go? They're that type of employees. Uh, many of the participants, they come from countries where the average daily wage is about $12 a day. Oh, wow. So, for them, so this money that they earn here is, is life-changing. I mean, they, they go back to their home countries and send money back, and they build homes and start businesses and, and, uh, and, and do those things to make their uh, families more secure uh, back home. That's really uh, taking a long view. So they're uh, they're committed because they're going to essentially take a position in America, generate not just income, but wealth, because now they're able to, you know, save it, bring it back to their family. And the family is going to benefit from uh, kind of that quality of compensation coming out. So so. Um, when do they how do they end the relationship that year at the end of the season or how does that work? So when you're going through the application process, you set out your seasonality that you can uh, approve. And the, the last few years, that has been, for me, November 1st. But huh. uh, as, as we've seen such an incredible growth, we've seen those first two weekends in November get busy. So uh, for 2024, we're, we're going to try to extend that to uh, November 15th. So. Uh, April 1 would be my date that I want to get them, and uh, November 15th would be the time that they would uh, leave the country. Um, so that's a big advantage because uh, they come off the payroll right at the time that you're slowing down. Uh, oh, got it. Thing, another big advantage of it is once you get into the program, you can request the same workers year after year. So it wow. lessens the time on training. They show up uh, ready to work and know the process. Um, and because you're able to get them back there, you can almost make crew leaders and uh, drivers uh, out of some of the uh, workers. One new worker that I had this year, a gentleman named Carlos, um, he came as a recommendation of one of my people that were here in 2022. It was a relative. And... Uh, he was a truck driver in El Salvador. And the minute he came, you notice certain things about him. If he was riding in a truck and the truck was backing up, he'd immediately get out unprompted to back the truck up into place. And just, you know, you started to notice safety features that professional drivers have. Um, and we, we spoke with him and uh, went in and, uh, lined up to take a driver's test and he passed it with flying colors and uh, got him on our insurance and he started driving for us this year. And it's a wow. big boom. It's a yeah. big boom. So, so you're able to develop them by getting them back year after year after year. And uh, they become comfortable with you, the surroundings, the job, they make relationships with your, your other employees. It, it really is a, um, a, a good program when it works the way it's supposed to. <laughs> well, and, and I was going to say, well, that leads us to another piece of this, but I want to, you know, just take a moment to comment on when you and I first spoke about this a couple of weeks back, um, I was uh, taken by uh, the fact that it really does seem like a win-win. Um, you know, you're benefiting obviously from a cost perspective, but they're benefiting on a whole nother level. You're changing, you know, like you said, you're you're making experiences that change lives. So that's pretty impressive. Yeah, my guys um, routinely uh, 
update me through WhatsApp and tell me what's going on in their life. You know, uh, last year at Thanksgiving time, uh, one of my guys, Javier, sent me a picture of a foundation. He said, I'm building my house. He said, it would not be possible without me working there this year. Thank you so much. Uh, another guy had uh, planted uh, cabbage in the in the months on the side of a mountain. And he grew these beautiful heads of cabbage. And they were so wonderful that the news in El Salvador picked him up and did a news story on it. So he said, my cabbage is famous throughout El Salvador. I'm, I'm, I'm famous. I'm a, I'm oh a TV my star in El Salvador <laughs> because of my cabbage. <laughs> so that is amazing. It's just That's good a- to see them making a, a difference. We had the, I shared those stories when we went to um, caucus last year. Oh, and cool. some of the senator's staff, uh, Senator Warner's staff, was just amazed at the pictures and, and you know, what a life-changing difference this money makes to, to the folks that participated. And the other thing is, is that, you know, it has got to take a tremendous amount of courage to a worker that doesn't speak the language to get on a plane, or get on a bus, travel to a country where you don't know who you're going to be working for. You don't know what you're going to do just for the promise of what, what, what America can deliver for you. So it, it, I've always been astounded at the courage of these guys to to, to undertake this. Because I, I don't know, at uh, 20, 25, 30 years old, I would have had the courage to leave everything yeah. that I knew behind and, uh, and stake something out like this. So. That's amazing. What a story. Incredible. So, all right, with every good thing, there's a bad thing or something at least that might frustrate you. So you've been in the program for uh, a few years now. Tell us what, from your perspective, what do you see as – current disadvantages of uh, H2B? Well, there's a lot of frustrations with the program. Because the program is so good when it works well, it's oversubscribed. Uh, okay. In the, the 2022 fiscal year, uh, there were over 154,000 applications for the 66,000 spots. Jeez, I, mentioned that it, I mentioned that that 66,000 was split into two parts. One is workers arriving October 1st and after that, and the other is for uh, workers arriving April 1st and beyond. So that April 1st date is always the more popular date. That's the date that all the landscapers want folks. That's the date that uh, that all the tent companies want folks. Um, You know, so it's a little bit different. So for the April 1st, 2023 start date, there were a hundred and almost 124,000 workers requested for the 33,000 allocated visas. So now, while the additional 66,000 help with the demand, it, it still doesn't cover the full need. Yeah, so that, that's why you hear from time to time people arguing for a returning worker provision. See, if they would exempt people that had worked here from that cap it would handle all the workload of the folks that that come in. Um, Another frustration with this company is, although they they have the last two years been very good about those additional 66,000, every time there's a change in administration, the additional visas seem to be delayed as new appointees are learning the job and learning the system. Oh, yeah, yeah. so when we have a change of administration, we all kind of just clench our teeth and think about how how long is it going to take them to get up to speed. Some people don't want to address a problem until it's a problem, you know. So uh, one of the first years in the Biden administration, they uh, they waited until the full thirty three thousand was allocated before they even thought about publishing a rule for the additional ones. That oh, has geez. gotten a lot better. Uh, the last two years, it has actually been smooth. The last two years, and it's all, it was already in place uh, prior to October first this year. Um, gotcha. So, because of the demand, um, the Department of Labor Labor holds a lottery for all companies, and you're assigned a group A through G. So A and B is what you imagine. You're going to get your workers around April one you know, or at least in April, C and D usually delayed till June or July, E or G, 
uh, you know, you might not get your workers. And that's about 30% of the companies that apply do not get wow. workers after going through the whole process. Oh, uh, wow. The other thing is that it's, uh, it, it's not cheap uh, and it's a lot of paperwork. Um, last year to get my six workers, it cost me about $10,000 for the filing fees, for the fees that the government charges and goes up every year to allow the workers to come in for the visa issuance and, and everything that's associated with it. So there is a, there is a, a significant cost and not a guarantee you're going to get workers. Wow, that's yeah, and and again, ten thousand dollars to get one or two workers might may be cost pro- prohibitive, but you know at least you're getting six. What um with H two B, um what else are we missing? I mean, we've heard about the advantages and disadvantages. What what else what else can you tell us? Well, you have a lot of uh, it's really been politicized uh, the H two B program, and that's a shame. Um, Every time I hear people talk about H2B and they talk about it's a it's an immigration issue. Well, it's really not. These people aren't coming to live here. You know, they, they're, they're coming to work. They're coming to make money and they're coming to leave. Uh, so some of the misconceptions that we run into the program is that, oh, well, you're just hiring foreigners because they're cheap labor. And um, that's far from the truth. What happens is, is that the wage the workers make is determined by the Department of Labor. They look at what the job entails. They look at the areas which you operate in, and they set a a wage determination rate. Um, That is usually higher than what we were able to hire unskilled labor for in my market. Uh, Mm. Just in my market, and my market is not a is not a very you know high wage market. But we would be able to hire untrained labor through the door uh, at $14 an hour. Uh, the determined wage rate was uh, 15.62 last year. Okay. And so yeah. what happens is, is that not only do you have to pay a higher rate for your worker, so it's definitely not cheap labor, anybody in your company in that job position has to make that wage rate as well. That's part okay. of it as well. So guys that maybe weren't making that much, you have to raise up to that much. Um, the other misconception is you get, oh, well, you're taking jobs away from Americans. But by employing a competent seasonal workforce, this actually creates more opportunity for Americans because you can take on more work. You can create higher paid jobs for crew leaders and drivers, and you need more people. If you don't have a competent seasonal workforce, you have to decline jobs. You have to shrink your workforce. You have to. You, 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 uh, good point. You really, it, it really makes a, a, a difference if you have um, skilled or unskilled seasonal labor that you can uh, rely on. Um, another misconception I've heard: Oh, well, they just come to the country and they leave. And I've heard that from politicians. You know, once they get here, they. They don't report and they just leave. Nothing, nothing could be further from the truth. Gotcha. The workers that come in under this program, they know that it's a privilege and that they don't do anything uh, that may keep them from coming back. My guys could work through November 1 this year, and I had them flying back on November 3rd. And they approached me that, hey, is, is that go good? I mean, I, I, I don't want to mess this thing up. You know, can I do? Yeah, you have 10 days to leave the country afterwards. You know. You, You don't have to leave on the day that you're supposed to stop working. Um, And and finally, you know, people think, oh, well, people want to come move permanently to the United States. That hasn't been my experience. Uh, My guys love their home country. And uh, by the time November rolls around, they're ready to get back to the warmth of of El Salvador. (laughs) Gotcha. Are are all of yours from El Salvador or do they come from different? They are. Uh, One of the things uh, in the program of the additional 66,000 visas is a carve out because um, uh, for one reason or another, I don't know why, but for one reason or another, the Mexican worker is the most sought after worker in the H2B program. Huh. Um, so when they, um, when they release the additional visas, 
they set aside maybe 20,000 for Northern Triangle companies, Honduras, Guatemala, and El Salvador. Gotcha. And so in order to get workers, uh, we, we said, we're going to go with the Northern Triangle workers. We're going to go ahead. It's a little more money. It's not uh, Mexican workers. A lot of times bus into the United States and yep. uh, with in El Salvador, you're, you're flying, you're paying the airfare. Yep. So yep. Um, it's a little more expensive, but uh, we've had nothing but a great experience with the uh, El Salvadorians that uh, have, have worked for us the last couple of years. Wow, I can't, I cannot believe how much we've learned here in 30 minutes. That's amazing. I, hopefully it's going to be super helpful to uh, our peer executive groups, listeners out there. Um, so Mike, help us out. How would we get started if we wanted to go down this path? So your first step is you need to find an experienced H2B company to work you through the process. Um, there are also law firms that specialize in this stuff, but you just can't go to your lawyer down the road and say, this is what I want to do. Uh, I have friends that have lost uh, tens of thousands of dollars with inexperienced wow. attorneys trying to work through the H2B process. You need to find somebody who does this for a living. This is their main line of business. And there's several of them out there. You can Google, you know, H2B workers and, and, and find five or six companies. Um, you know, how I found it is I went to some of the companies in Virginia uh, that I knew through networking. And who do you use? And they told me. And I went to a big landscaper who brings in another hundred uh, hundred people every year. I said, who do you use? And, and fortunately, it was the same company. So I said, well, that's the person I'm going to use. And that's the person I've been with uh, since the beginning, a company called Moss Labor in Charlottesville, Virginia. Um, oh, wow. The other thing is that you got to realize is if you're listening to this and go, man, I got to get on this uh, before the end of the year for 2024, you're already too late. Uh, you have to start the process, especially as a new applicant, uh, in July the previous year. So that's how long it takes to get your numbers together, to get your paperwork together. And a, a good, experienced H2B company will work, will walk you through all this. You will not have headaches uh, if you use a good company uh, to work with. Um, the other thing is you got to be dedicated to the process. It's hard when you're in August or September and they send you a thing and said, hey, I need this back in a week. And uh, you barely have enough time to get through your day. But uh, you, you've got to return that information promptly. Your caseworker will appreciate it and uh, and everything will run smooth it's, is if, uh, you know, uh, you, you return promptly. And then you need to start thinking about housing, you know, and transportation because uh, you have to have. You don't have to pay for the housing, but you have to arrange the housing. Now, whether that's apartments or whether that's uh, the trailer parks or whether that's whatever, and then you have to get them to work until, you know, unless one comes with a license or a worker has a license or that ability to get a license. You, you, you have those two things to consider. Uh, for us, we knew we were in it for the long haul. So we were able to pick up a, a house, a three bedroom, two bath house uh, within a half a mile of my shop. And uh, so they can walk or bike to work and, and, uh, and, and, and be covered. So, but that's certainly, you know, some of the things to consider uh, as you start the process, when it works, it's absolutely beautiful. It, uh, it is absolutely a joy having my workers here. Um, was a joy this year. Um, once a week, I would carve out time to take them to the uh, to the uh, Walmart to buy groceries, and I treat them to lunch every Sunday. And we would just talk about the week and what's going on in their lives and stuff like that. And wow. I mean, it really it really uh, it really adds a lot to your company uh, to have these guys working, dedicated. And uh, and just basically, uh, you know, ready to do whatever you ask them to do to to make your company successful. It sounds very fulfilling and uh, both on a personal level as well as uh, for your culture of your business. So that's awesome. So, Mike Fitzwater, thank you so much for joining us. Special Events Virginia. 
anyone has any questions, by all means, reach out to us at the program and we will connect you in with Mike. And Mike, you, re- you all right if we have people give you a shout for a question? Absolutely. Absolutely. You can find me at uh, virginiaspecialevents.com. You can email me off the website. Uh, you can call me at my office. Uh, happy to do so. And uh, and Dan, I want to thank you. You know, I've been uh, involved in PEER now about two years. And uh, it's just amazing that the focus that you can put on your business um, when you're accountable to other people in your peer groups. And uh, you do a, a great job and a great service uh, for oh, the well, business appreciate- owners in your groups. We appreciate that. We appreciate our members and uh, certainly appreciate a great topic for a podcast like this, H2B. So thanks for joining us, Mike Fitzwater. Take care. Take care. Bye-bye. You've been listening to Peer Talk from Peer Executive Groups, produced and directed by Noah Crowley and hosted by Dan Crowley. Subscribe to this podcast for notifications of future episodes of Peer Talk.